not be on a peak. Uh, and it's possible to be wrong about how to get to the closest peak. Uh, and this, is, um, this, this falls out simply out of the observation that whatever conscious experiences are possible for us are a product of the way the universe is. I mean, this is, this is uh, our conscious experience is arising out of the laws of nature and our entanglement with the way the world is. And uh, it seems to me, therefore, there, this is a, d a domain of right and wrong answers to the questions of how to maximize uh, human flourishing uh, in any instance. Uh, and this is incredibly simple to see. If you, just, if you just imagine two people on Earth, I mean, there's only two people alone on Earth. We can call them Adam and Eve. And you ask yourself, well, you know, is there a right answer or a wrong answer to how they might maximize their well-being? And clearly there, I mean, the wrong answer number one, you smash each other in the face with a large rock. You know, this is not, that's not the best strategy to maximize your, your well-being in this circumstance. Um, and yes, there are zero-sum games that they could find, and they could, they, 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 could be, they could be psychopaths, they could fail to collaborate. But clearly, the best answers to their circumstance are not going to be zero-sum. They're going to be, they're going to, they're, 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 the prospects of, of, of their flourishing uh, and finding deeper and more durable sources of satisfaction are going to be uh, exposed by um, some kind of cooperation. And all the concerns that people normally bring in to, um, uh, you know, deontological concerns and, and a Rawlsian concern about fairness, all of that falls into this uh, vision of just how they would navigate the space of possible experiences, finding some peak of flourishing, even if it's not the only peak. And again, multiple, multiply equi multiple equivalent but different outcomes still gives us a realistic space in which there are right and wrong answers to, to moral questions. Um, and one thing we should not be confused about is the, the, the difference between answers in practice and answers in principle. And this is a fantastically complicated problem. And it, it gets more complicated when you add 6.7 billion people to Adam and Eve's circumstance. But I don't think it, it, it's not a different problem. It just gets more complicated. And uh, but by analogy, we could, we could think about um, economics. You know, is, is, is economics a science yet? Apparently not. I mean, judging from the last few years, it's, it would seem yeah, it's not. Um, Maybe economics will never get better than it is now. Maybe we'll just fundamentally be surprised every decade by something that's happened, and, and, and we're, we'll realize that we're blinded by just the complexity of the situation, or our models suck. Or, um, but there's to say that it's practically difficult or impossible to answer certain problems does not mean that there are not right and wrong answers to the problems. And nobody would say that there are no right and wrong answers to how to design economic systems or to respond to financial crises. Um, nobody would say that it's a form of bigotry to criticize another country's or culture's response to a, a banking failure, say. Um, and, and, and just imagine how terrifying it would be if the smartest people around were all more or less in agreement that we had to be non-judgmental about everyone's view of, of economics and everyone's response to global economic uh, crises. And, uh, and yet that is exactly where we stand, I think, as an intellectual community on the most important questions in human life. And I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't think you have, you've enjoyed the life of the mind until you have seen someone, uh, some philosopher or scientist, talk about the contextual legitimacy of the burqa or female genital excision, or um, any of these other practices that, that emerge out of other cultures, uh, which are just so clearly the, the cause of needless human misery. And yet we have convinced ourselves that somehow we, that science uh, is by definition a value-free space, and therefore we can't make value judgments about uh, practices needlessly subverting our opportunity to live in a, in, a, in a happy and sane world. Um, the truth is, science is not value-free. Science, good science is the product 
of, uh, of our making value judgments with respect to things like valuing evidence and logical consistency and um, parsimony and all, all other quite value-laden virtues. And if you don't value those things, you actually can't, you can't, uh, you can't have the scientific conversation. And, I, and I'm saying if you, we, we need not worry about the people who don't value human flourishing or human well-being. The people who come to the table and say, actually, you know, we just want to cut people's heads off at halftime at the soccer game because we, you know, are, we have a book that has been dictated by the creator of the universe. Um, that kind of conversation, we are free to say, well, that's not actually morality, just like your physics isn't physics. Uh, uh, and uh, it seems to me to be the same move, intellectually speaking. Uh, it seems to me to be cashed out by the same uh, entanglement with, with real facts about the way the universe is. In this case, in, in, in terms of morality, it's real facts about how the experience of, of conscious creatures can change, for better or worse. Um, and uh, it seems to me to be scientifically just as legitimate. Uh, and yet it's, 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 uh, uh, it's not the project that most people engaged in a, in a uh, science of morality are, are uh, um, thinking about. So anyway, I think I'll just I'll leave it there. That was 20 minutes. So.